Tonight, Kanye's empire collapsing, the stunning downfall after weeks of offensive comments. Adidas announcing tonight they are severing all ties with Kanye West after the rapper unleashed a slew of anti-Semitic and hateful remarks. The Gap following suit, bringing an end to Kanye's reign in the world of fashion. What the massive split will mean for Ye's status as a billionaire. Also breaking tonight, the chilling new details about that deadly school shooting in St. Louis. Police finding an AR-15, 600 rounds of ammo, and a handwritten note left by the killer. What it revealed about a possible motive as we're learning more about the two lives tragically lost. Russia rejects Brittany Griner's appeal. The WNBA star ordered to serve another seven years behind bars. The growing fears tonight, could Griner end up in one of Russia's notorious penal colonies? Battleground debates, Dr. Oz and John Fetterman sharing the stage for the first time as they fight for that critical Senate seat in Pennsylvania. Plus the fiery debate in Florida, what Governor Ron DeSantis said when pressed about a possible bid for the White House. Plus Grand Canyon rescue, Five tourists stranded in a cavern more than 200 feet below ground. How crews were finally able to pull them out after more than 24 hours. And you may have seen this image, a father covered in dust, sitting in the stands of a Kentucky basketball game. Tonight, the story behind that photo and the coal miner who refused to cave on his commitment to his son. Top story starts right now. Tonight, it all falls down for Kanye West, the highly controversial rapper now on an island alone. Virtually no brands willing to be associated with his toxic image. A series of hateful comments landing Kanye in this spot, making repeated derogatory comments about Jewish people and promoting slogans associated with white supremacist groups. One of the final straws, this demonstration by an anti-Semitic group in Los Angeles. Their sign citing Kanye by name and the backlash on social media was swift. The culmination of months of bad behavior, brand after brand severing ties, the Gap, Balenciaga, Vogue, and talent agency CAA all dropping Kanye, Twitter and Instagram blocking him from their platforms. But the biggest blow, that deal with Adidas, which produces Kanye's Yeezy brand sneakers and clothing, that partnership making Kanye a billionaire, but now the split expected to cost both sides hundreds of millions of dollars. Let's bring in our panel, entertainment journalist Shagun Odolowu, the vice president for the Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism, Oren Siegel, and TV host and entertainment reporter for Hip Hollywood, Jasmine Simpkins. Thank you all for joining Top Story tonight. Shagun, I want to start with you. So is this the end of Kanye West? He has the money and the resources to go on, but will fans stay in his camp, especially younger fans who for the last two years have leaned into social justice, equality, and anti-racism? Well, the first thing, Tom, that we have to understand is Kanye West craves oxygen. And like CPR, it only works when we give it to him. So as, as a narcissist who's, cre who's creating drama because he wants all of that air to be around him, as you take that air away, he loses his steam, he loses his power. I do think young people are getting fed up because this generation is very active and very voiceful in it's not enough to say you are something, you have to actively show them how you are that thing or how you are against that thing. We all know that none of the isms is is a good thing. Sexism, racism, anti-Semitism. Most rational people are against that. That Kanye keeps standing on a soapbox and is being bolstered by hate groups says enough for me that his music, what, what he, whatever he puts out, I wasn't a fan really of the clothing or the shoes anyway. So, you know, that him being dropped by Adidas and Gap doesn't move the needle for me. These are business decisions. As we heard in the piece, $246 million dollars is what Adidas may stand to lose by the end of the year. So these were money decisions, right? Gap didn't have much to lose. Balenciaga didn't have much to lose. None of these people deserve pats on the back for doing the right thing. We'll see what transpires later, and we'll see if they still have that energy and aren't willing to breathe life into Kanye. Or it took a, it, thank you, Shagun. Or it took a minute for Adidas and for Gap to terminate their relationship. Is it enough? And do you think these companies maybe gave him too much of a runway leading up to this? I mean, we're not sure why it took so long. It should have happened faster. But the fact that it did happen, that some of these partnerships are now over, 
that is an important moment. It suggests that accountability is possible. When somebody has a following and an influence as large as he does and has an impact on so many people who idolize him and then spews the type of hatred that we know has led to violence when corporations, other celebrities, other institutions hold that person accountable, we need to view that as an important step and a good day. Doesn't mean it's over, but there are lessons to be learned and a model for future situations like this. People can take responsibility to hold those accountable and not put hate not put hate as a means to get profit. That was the statement Adidas made today. As somebody who is Jewish, if you see somebody wearing Yeezys or blasting Kanye's music or still supporting his other art forms, does that upset you now? No, I don't think it's that simple, right? There's a whole body of work and people liked his music well before perhaps they realized that he was an anti-Semite. But he is a brand in and of himself. And to the degree that people, other corporations, are gonna profit from that brand or even endorse and support it, that's unacceptable. But individuals have to make their own decisions. You know, you can really dislike somebody but really love their art. I think that's still possible. But frankly, we're here to talk about what Ye has, Ye has been talking about, not necessarily the past music. So are you saying that, that Kanye West may represent anti-Semitism, but the Yeezy brand, Kanye's music maybe does not? No, I'm saying people who appreciate his music before he got into this doubling down on anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, I can understand And what that. about the clothing, the, the, the shoes and the, and the clothes? Yeah, I mean, I think people, in a sense, are making a decision about who they endorse based on what they buy. More importantly, a stronger message from the, comes from the companies that really make a lot of money off of people and their ideas. Jasmine, at what point... Can I ask does, Orn a question? Hold, hold on, Shigun, hold on one second. Jasmine, at what point does this start to affect his music? Variety already reporting that streams of his music are down. Do you see his songs getting pulled, radio and streaming, just not playing Kanye anymore? Well, when you speak of radio, yeah, there are a lot of radio hosts like Charlemagne the God, who's on uh, The Breakfast Club, Ebro in the morning. You've seen a lot of radio uh, talent and hosts speaking out against Kanye's comments in recent weeks and days, many of them um, saying that they won't do interviews with him. So that is definitely going to affect um, his music being played on those radio platforms. Streaming is going to be something different. If individuals decide that they still want to listen to Kanye's music on Spotify and Pandora and places like that, will remain to be seen. One thing we have seen historically with Kanye, though, is that his rants and the things that he's been doing have all been connected to music releases. 2018, when he was on TMZ and said slavery was a choice, he dropped music shortly thereafter, and that did not affect that particular album and the concert that followed. We will see if he decides to put out music. He does not have a label home right Jasper, now. Jasper, but do you, think, do you think this time is different, though? I think this time is different in the sense that Def Jam has dropped him as an artist, has dropped his good music imprint, which is going to affect the artists who are on that label. And so I do think that a lot of people are going to pull back from him. I think it will be a long time before he has a label deal or if he ever has a label mm. deal again. He may be putting out music independently. Um, but I do think it is going to affect his streams because, as Variety has reported, People are not going to listen to Kanye. The saying we want the old Kanye back has been going on for a long time because his music has shifted during um, recent years with his mental health challenges. And I do think people are distancing themselves from his brands altogether, the music, the clothing, everything. Shigun, up to this point, he was a cultural icon. Yeah. People were collaborating mm -hmm. with him. We were talking about this, I think, earlier this summer on, on certain uh, albums that were coming out, and he was still appearing, he was still rapping. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think happens now to him? Well, the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? At the end of the day, you know, we as a culture, and, and by culture, I mean America at large, we tolerate bad behavior if the art or the sportsmanship or the politics or whatever, we can find a way to be okay with it. You know, the, the, the question that I had for Oren, and, and I'm glad Jasmine brought it up, Kanye has been saying inflammatory things for a very long time now. In 2018, when he said slavery was a choice, I didn't see people saying, get off the Kanye West bandwagon. I didn't see Adidas dropping him. In fact, 
What he said in 2018, he got a deal with Gap in 2020, and Balenciaga jumped on board in 2022. So I just have a hard time patting anyone on the back for doing what they're supposed to do. When you said it was, you know, why did it take this long? I could say in 2018, he should have been dropped. He should have been dropped by Def Jam when he said slavery was a choice. He never should have been able to get, you know, these contracts with these bad behavior and all of these different clothing lines supporting him. I'm not here to say who's had it worse or anything like that. But when you look at what he's been courting, counterculture, explosive comments, derisive and divisive behavior, like this is like, I'm not surprised when someone shows you who they are, we shouldn't be surprised at what they do. Believe them, right? We're acting as if we can't believe Kanye West has, has said this. Kanye West, before the comments in 2018, got on TV and said George Bush doesn't like black people. We remember that. We remember him commandeering the microphone from Taylor Swift at an award ceremony. This is par for the course. What I'm more upset at is the virtue signaling by a lot of these brands that want to say we disavow ourselves from Kanye like Vogue and Gap that really didn't have anything to lose. The only person or only entity that had okay. a significant financial loss is Adidas. I understand why they drug their Shigun, feet, but let's, I, I let's wanna be get, honest, I wanna get Orin business, in here. not moral high ground. Okay, Shigun, thank you. Orin, if, if you could talk to Kanye tonight, what, what would you say? First of all, I just want to say, you know, taking a microphone from Taylor Swift is not the same right, thing. Right, you can't compare of, the two. Com, you know, talking about the entire Jewish people. But if I could say one thing, I would not necessarily talk to him directly at this time because I think he continues to double down as his anti-Semitism. But maybe, maybe throughout all this, there will be regret, education, a different perspective. Just stop being an anti-Semite. That's the most important thing right now. But what would you want him to do? Would you want him to come out, meet with the Jewish community? Would you want him to come out, apologize for everything? Has he said, can, can he ever make, make up for this? Can he ever come back from this? He needs to start by stop being an anti-Semite. Stop putting White Lives Matter t-shirts on, which is offensive and also harkens out to other white supremacists. There are a lot of things he has to do first. Okay, Oren, Jasmine, Shagoon, we thank you all for joining Top Story tonight. All right, we want to switch gears now to the latest on that high school shooting in St. Louis that left a student and a teacher dead. Police revealing new details about the gunman, including the AR-15 he used, and new evidence found in his car shows the quick police response likely saved countless lives. Emily Aketa is in St. Louis tonight with that new reporting. Tonight, a trove of evidence shedding light on what may have driven a 19-year-old to storm his alma mater, gunning down a sophomore and teacher, and injuring at least seven. Investigators discovering a letter in the suspect's car parked outside Central Visual and Performing Arts High School. He spoke about uh, his desire to, con to engage in this incident, to, to conduct this school shooting. The handwritten note reads in part, I don't have any friends. I don't have any family. I've never had a girlfriend. I've never had a social life. I've been an isolated loner my entire life. This was the perfect storm for a mass shooter. A mass shooter that claimed the lives of beloved health and physical education teacher Jean Kuska and sophomore Alexandria Bell. The student's father calling her death a nightmare. No matter how I felt, I can talk to her and it was, it was all right. That was my baby. Armed with an AR-15 style weapon and 600 rounds of ammunition, police say the suspect Orlando Harris's shooting rampage could have been even worse. Well, this could have been a horrific scene. Um, it was not by the grace of God and that the officers were as close as they were. Officers who already happened to be in the area for another event say they arrived on scene within five minutes of the first 911 call and made it to the gunman on the third floor within another eight minutes. The suspect shot dead. Police would not say how the team broke into the school or obtained a long gun plus a stockpile of ammunition. When you got there, what did you see? It was chaos. Student parent Michael Bishop applauds the police's rapid response, but notes the trauma will follow his daughter and her classmates. She's going to second guess going into any school, any building with people for, for who knows how long, and it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. All right, Emily Aketa joins us now from St. Louis, outside that high school where a memorial is growing tonight. We can see it there behind you, Emily. This is another American community rocked by gun violence. How are those two victims you mentioned there being remembered tonight? 
Tom, rain or shine, we continue to see members of the community turn out here to pay their respects to the sophomore and teacher, their lives tragically taken. It's a picture that we're all too familiar with. Balloons, notes, and uh, flowers lining this school turned crime scene happening now. There's a vigil nearby at a local church. It is the second vigil of today. Tom. Emily Akena for us tonight. Emily, thank you for that. We went ahead to Russia now where WNBA superstar Brittany Griner's appeal was flatly rejected today by a Russian court. She's been wrongfully detained for eight months despite diplomatic efforts to get her released. Now she's facing up to eight more years in one of Russia's harshest penal colonies. NBC's chief foreign affairs correspondent Andrea Mitchell has the latest. Brittany Griner today appearing via video link from behind bars, pleading for leniency against long odds. This has been a very traumatic um, experience waiting for this day. I just beg that the court takes in all of the mistakes that were overlooked during the first court and reassess my, my sentence here. But the judges quickly ruled she must serve another eight years for smuggling less than a gram of cannabis, worse than she'd feared. I think Brittany herself um, is quite... Is quite pessimistic about the outcome. Griner's former Olympic coach, after seeing her today. You hear the hopelessness in her voice. You know, you hear her trying to be strong, probably trying to be strong for her wife, Sherelle, and her family. On Griner's 32nd birthday last week, she wrote from her cell, thank you everyone for fighting so hard to get me home. Secretary of State Blinken now tweeting, today's result is another failure of justice, compounding the injustice of her detention. Her agent calling Griner a hostage, a political pawn. Her last hope, a prisoner swap. President Biden tonight saying they're in constant contact with the Russians. And so far, we've not been meeting with much uh, positive response, but we're not stopping. The president could make the case of Vladimir Putin directly at next month's G20 in Bali, Indonesia. Hopefully, that would be before Brittany Griner is sent to one of Russia's notorious penal colonies. Tom? Okay, Andrea Mitchell for us tonight. Andrea, we thank you. For more on the latest developments in the Brittany Griner saga, we want to bring in former U.S. ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall. Ambassador McFall, thank you for joining Top Story once again. We just heard there in Andrea's piece that the president is saying his office has been in constant contact with Russian authorities. You've been the one handling negotiations with Russia in the past. Do you think we'll see Brittany Griner, and I also want to mention Paul Whelan, who is being held in a Russian prison as well. Do we see both of them, either of them, on U.S. soil before the new year? Well, let me first add to your list Mark Fogel, who's also an American wrongly detained, uh, sitting in a jail cell in Russia as well. Uh, I don't know the answer to your question. I want to be honest with you. I don't think anybody knows the answer to your question. Uh, this moment had to come. Uh, families, friends, and, and, and uh, always hope that this will be a breakthrough moment, and it never is in Russia. We need to be crystal clear. There is no rule of law in Russia today, tragically. But this moment has to come before a negotiation can start, because now all the appeals are over, and this gives the opportunity, maybe, for a deal to be done. It's been hinted at before. There's this guy, Victor Boot, who's a real criminal, by the way, not like Brittany Griner. They want him back. Mr. Putin personally wants him back. And maybe now, the, the, the contours of a deal can be negotiated. Ambassador, do you think there's any other way that Griner comes home without a swap? She'll come home at the end of her term uh, if it tragically ends with that, but no, I don't. I think it, it uh, demands a swap, and I know this is controversial. I know some people think, oh, if you do this, if you swap Americans who are incarcerated, that encourages other countries to do so and encourage terrorists to do, to do so. Uh, with respect to Russia, I disagree with that analysis. I don't think this will lead to more people being arrested. Uh, and therefore, I think it's a, it's a trade worth doing. Victor Boot is a really bad guy. Uh, I dealt with offers to, to negotiate about his transfer many, many times, way back when I was ambassador. But in this moment, at this time, I think a deal uh, is the right thing to do. And I hope uh, the Russian officials and American officials can get it done. The top U.S. diplomat in Russia spoke to the Russian media earlier today. Let's hear that. Ms. Greiner appeared by video in the trial today, uh, so we were not allowed to communicate with her. 
Uh, therefore, we will continue to request consular access so we can um, be in touch with Ms. Greiner directly regarding her, wel where her welfare and how she is doing. Ambassador, how concerning is that? It doesn't sound like U.S. diplomats have too much access to Brittany Griner. They haven't even laid eyes on her in some cases. Is this all part of the negotiating tools for the Russians just to make it tougher and harder on the Americans? Well, first of all, it's outrageous. It violates all kinds of international norms and treaties that, that, that uh, dip diplomats do not have access to her. Uh, that was not the way it was when I was in Russia uh, just several years ago. So things are getting worse in Russia. Uh, that's what it says to me. Uh, I do think it's a, it could be a pressure tactic to try to put more pressure on the Americans to try to get her out as soon as possible. Um, tragically, these are the kinds of things that Mr. Putin does in the way that he negotiates uh, with Americans and, frankly, Ukrainians and everybody around the world in very e illegal, uh, dastardly ways. Ambassador Michael McFaul, we appreciate you joining Top Story tonight. We always appreciate your analysis. Okay, we want to turn to politics here in the United States, the midterms, namely. Just two weeks away, and tonight, Dr. Oz and John Fetterman will face off in the only debate in that crucial Senate race in Pennsylvania. This is new polling shows one party is gaining momentum nationwide. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Kristen Welker reports. Tonight, just hours before the critical one and only debate, Pennsylvania Democratic Senate candidate John Fetterman's campaign with a striking attempt to lower expectations, declaring Republican Dr. Mehmet Oz has a huge built-in advantage, saying Fetterman is dealing with a lingering audio processing challenge after his stroke in May, and writing Fetterman is going to win this race, even if he doesn't win the debate. Tonight's debate is unprecedented, with Fetterman requesting closed captioning monitors like the ones he used in an interview with NBC News. Fetterman with this explanation over the weekend. It's the elephant in the room uh, having, having a stroke. There's a monitor right now using captioning so I can fully you know, uh, understand everything in terms of from hearing. The debate comes as Dr. Oz has been gaining in the polls. The debate we're having tomorrow night is going to reinforce John Fetterman's radical positions. Our latest NBC News poll showing Republicans with momentum in their fight to take back control of Congress. 71% of Americans now saying the country is on the wrong track and Republicans leading in congressional preference among likely voters, 48% to 47%. Republicans with a nine-point enthusiasm edge, while in Florida, a fiery debate Debate between Republican Governor Ron DeSantis and Democrat Charlie Crist. Crist pressing DeSantis, who is seen as a likely presidential contender. Will you serve a full four year term if you're reelected governor of Florida? It's not a tough time. question. Well, listen, I know that Charlie's interested in talking about 2024 and Joe Biden, but I just want to make things very, very clear. The only worn out old donkey I'm looking to put out to pasture is Charlie Crist. <laughs> Well, you heard there about the challenges for Fetterman. There are also steep hurdles for Dr. Oz, whose campaign was criticized for attacking Fetterman's health. There will be a lot of scrutiny on his tone. Plus, he'll have to answer those charges. He's a celebrity candidate who's not from Pennsylvania. Tom. Kristen Welker with those all-important debates happening across the country. Kristen, thank you. With candidates hitting the debate stage in the final days of the campaign, can they sway voters to their side, or are the contests all but decided? I want to bring in NBC News political analyst and former Republican Congressman Carlos Corbello, who joins Top Story tonight. Carlos, I want to play another moment from last night's debate in Florida, where you are, where DeSantis appears to get booed while talking about his handling of the pandemic. Let's listen. When a once in a century pandemic hit, I led based on facts, not based on fear. Uh, I lifted you up while some like Charlie Chris wanted to lock you down. I took a lot of flack in the process, but through it all, I was always more concerned about protecting your job than I was about saving my own. An interesting crowd last night in that debate there, Carlos. The, the, the auditorium wasn't full, but you clearly could hear them over the microphones. If the polls are to be believed here, the race is DeSantis is to lose. What are your big takeaways from last night? Well, Tom, yes, it was a rowdy crowd on both sides, to be fair. Both candidates were booed, and there was a lot of applause as well. Look, this race has been pretty steady from the beginning. Ron DeSantis has been ahead in the polls. He has a big fundraising advantage over Charlie Crist. Uh, he's dwarfing Crist's advertising on television and other uh, media here in the state of Florida. 
Last night's debate was lively. Both candidates uh, uh, jabbed at one another. However, a lot of people think that Charlie Chris really needed to provoke a gaffe from Ron DeSantis, really needed to land a knockout punch, and that didn't happen. So two weeks out, Tom, most people think that uh, Ron DeSantis is still the strong favorite here to get reelected. Carlos, I also want to ask you about this poll from Telemundo. It was first brought up by Mark Caputo, one of our reporters. It showed that 51% of Hispanic voters backed DeSantis, and it also showed 50% of Hispanic voters approved of his decision to fly Venezuelan migrants to Martha's Vineyard. We say all the time that Latino voters are not a monolith. Clearly, we know that. Both of you, both you and I know that. But what does this tell us about how campaigns should look at this voting bloc, especially in Florida, a, a state that is filled with refugees? Well, that's right, Tom. The Latino community is extremely diverse, and not just from state to state, but even within states. In South Florida, the Latino community is a lot more conservative than in other parts of the state. And that's what you're seeing in these polls. Now, what is remarkable is that there are some very clear trends here. Uh, four years ago, when Ron DeSantis first ran for governor, he lost the Hispanic vote by about 10 points in this state. Uh, the NBC Telemundo poll shows that now he's ahead by some six or seven points. So, yes, the, the Hispanic community is diverse, but there is a clear trend, certainly in Florida and in other parts of the country, with Latinos increasingly supporting Republicans. And Ron DeSantis appears to be benefiting from that here in this state as he tries to get reelected. Carlos, north of you in Pennsylvania, Kristen mentioned tonight's debate will be closely watched and Fetterman's team is setting expectations. I want to put up a part of a letter they put out to their supporters and, and, and on social media saying in part, John is going to win this race even if he doesn't win this debate. Do you think this will be a deciding factor for voters? Obviously setting expectations there, pretty smart on the part of the Fetterman campaign. That's right. And look, uh, the expectations for Mr. Fetterman have been low the whole race, so he has benefited from that. And so far, it doesn't look like voters are uh, in any way punishing him or uh, holding uh, his condition against him. That race has also been very stable. Dr. Oz has close the margin here in uh, in recent weeks but uh even uh, you know the latest polling shows Fetterman still with a lead so his campaign is smart to downplay his chances of winning the debate tonight and uh if things stay as they are in Pennsylvania he should have a pretty good chance of winning Carlos Crubella for us tonight from Miami Carlos we appreciate it still ahead an update on a story we've been following for weeks a teenager shot by police while he sat in his car now fighting for his life in the hospital his family's message for police plus the massive inferno on a Florida highway what we're learning about the cars involved in that crash and the warning about dry shampoos some brands containing dangerous chemicals linked to cancer the bottles you should toss tonight stay with us top story just getting started Back now with a major rescue at the Grand Canyon Caverns, a tourist mecca that turned scary for a group trapped below. Miguel Almaguer has the details. The four-hour rescue unfolded more than 200 feet underground. This narrow and dark elevator shaft, the only way up for four tourists trapped 21 stories down after the elevator malfunctioned at the base of the Grand Canyon Caverns. That's when we start realizing, like, this is real. Suddenly stuck, Felicia Jimenez and her family needed help from the local sheriff's department in Peach Springs, Arizona, who used manpower and a series of ropes and levers to winch up the stranded from the cavern floor. The steep stairway to the popular tourist attraction, not an option for the four older members of Jimenez's family with with mobility issues. If you can picture a fire escape on the side of a, a tall building, uh, you know, like I think we think of New York, and you'd have to do that for 21 floors. We've all agreed on this, grateful for our family members, because things have could have gone way worse when they got hoisted out somebody could have fell the stranded stuck for 26 hours did have access to this single hotel suite run by the company who operates inside the cave but not by choice i just feel a lot of love for my family it makes you not want to take anything for granted after a 30 minute tour became nearly a 30 hour ordeal tonight everyone is back above ground after a rocky start to a deep excursion
Tom, the entire family trapped in the caverns is back home now. As you heard, they're all grateful to be out. And tonight they tell us they have no plans to go underground anytime soon. Tom, back to you. All right, I think that's a good idea. Coming up next, a search for an attempted kidnapper in Florida, a man seen on camera trying to snatch a 10-year-old on two separate occasions. But police have revealed about that suspect. Stay with us. All right, we are back now with Top Stories Newsfeed, and we begin with the search for the suspect behind two attempted kidnappings in Florida. A home security cam capturing a 10-year-old girl running down a street in Fort Lauderdale. You see her right there, a man dressed in all black, seen following behind her. Police say the man allegedly tried to grab the girl twice in two days near her elementary school. Authorities say he may be driving a black van. Pretty scary. Also in Florida, a fiery crash shutting down part of Interstate 95, I-95 in Palm Beach County. New video shows fire Firefighters working to put out the flames that spread, look at that, across both sides of the highway. Police say a driver crashed into a fuel tanker, causing it to flip over. The burning fuel then traveling through a storm drain and causing a second fire on the side of the highway. At least four people were injured, three of them critically. A 5.1 magnitude ra earthquake rattling parts of the Bay Area. The quake striking about 12 miles east of San Jose. At least two aftershocks have been recorded so far. No reports of injuries or serious damage. It's the largest earthquake in the Bay Area since 2014. And the U.S. Postal Service unveiled their 2023 stamps, including a special honor for late Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The former SCOTUS judge will be honored as an icon of American culture. Other notable figures in the 2023 series include writers Ernest J. Gaines and Toni Morrison. All stamps will be available for purchase starting in January. All right, now to a health alert. Unilever issuing a recall for 19 types of aerosol dry shampoo because of potentially elevated levels of benzene. Take a look right here, a chemical known to cause cancer in humans. NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us now. So Dr. Torres, the danger, is it in spraying those products or inhaling them? It could be either, and it's in coming contact with your body. Benzene is a product that if you get it into your lungs, it can cause something called pneumonitis. If it absorbs through your skin, it can cause other health conditions as well. And so you have to be concerned about this and the main issue with this especially with the Unilever recall is that it's not labeled on the can itself because it's not supposed to be in there it's a contaminant and so now they're saying they found that in there they're recalling them and they're saying anything October 21st or earlier that you want to look at in those if you do have those products get rid of them. Benzene, what exactly is it? So benzene is a byproduct of petroleum. It's in gasoline, it's in heating oil, it's in furniture polish, it's in a lot of different things. It's not supposed to be in your hairspray, and that's a concerning thing because somehow it got in there, possibly from contamination at the manufacturing process. We don't really know, but the important thing is that they're at least telling us now so you can take care of it. Theoretically speaking, this shouldn't be in other dry shampoos because dry shampoos are pretty popular right now. Yeah, it shouldn't be in dry shampoos. It shouldn't be in hairsprays, anything like that. Now, the concern with benzene is benzene is a potentially cancer-causing substance, and that's a concern here. If you, get it in, if you get it absorbed through your skin, if you inhale it, it can cause a leukemia or other types of blood disorders. And, you know, short-term irritation, not that big of an issue. Long-term, it can go ahead and cause these blood disorders, leukemia. You know, obviously, these are things that are potentially very dangerous, so you want to be careful. This is the sixth product recall with benzene this year, according to the FDA. How can consumers be sure that the products they're buying are safe? You know, for the most part, they're very safe, but this is actually a bit of a tough, tough question to answer because the question I'm getting is, you know, why didn't the FDA do something about this? Why didn't the FDA, you know, why do they approve it to begin with? Well, number one, the FDA approves drugs and medicines. They do not approve cosmetics or things like hairsprays. By law, they're not allowed to do that. So the companies can put them on the market as long as it's safe the way they use it. But at the same time, the companies are the ones that deem it to be safe, so the FDA can only step in afterwards and say, there's something wrong with this. As a matter of fact, by law, the FDA can't even force a recall. They have to go to the Department of Justice, to the court system, and do it. And so their hands are tied for a bit. So, a bit. so we know, obviously, cigarettes are bad for your lungs. Alcohol is bad for your liver. If you use them every day, it's not going to be good for your body. Is this one of those things where if you're using it every day, it could be detrimental? And it certainly could be. And as a matter of fact, benzene is in cigarette smoke as well. And so that's one of the reasons that cigarette smoke can be so harmful. Same thing here. If you're using this every day, if you've been using it every day for a week, you know, talk to your doctor. Is there something I need to do? Because there's no real test for this other than doing a blood test to make sure your blood is okay, you know, because it does cause those blood disorders. But otherwise, you know, get rid of it, stop using it, and hopefully things should turn out fine.
Dr. John, thank you for this. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Okay, time now for Top Stories Global Watch and the tropical cyclone slamming Bangladesh. The storm unleashing heavy rains and strong winds. Widespread flooding shutting down roadways and destroying tens of thousands of homes, farms, and fishing areas. So far, at least two dozen people are dead and 20,000 are stranded. Millions of people now are, are without power. In the Americas, Brazil's leftist candidate and former President Lula has a slight edge over far-right incumbent Jair Bolsonaro in the latest poll. The new poll shows Lula leading by seven percentage points ahead of Sunday's runoff election. Lula has maintained a lead in recent weeks, but many fear Bolsonaro, who has pushed claims of election fraud, will not accept those results. And popular messaging service WhatsApp suffering a worldwide outage today. Users on the Meta-owned platform were unable to send messages for hours. The glitch has been fixed, but it's the second widespread issue for a Meta-owned platform this year after a spam problem with Facebook back in August. Okay, and we will be right back. Okay, we are back with the latest on that surge in children who are sick with respiratory viruses, including RSV. Pediatric emergency rooms nationwide beyond max capacity. Hospitals saying they simply do not have enough beds or staff for all the kids who need them. Here's NBC's Tom Costello. In Northern Virginia, the respiratory virus known as RSV has made its way into four-year-old Nova Lewis's lungs. How are you feeling? <laughs> Struggling to breathe with an existing heart condition, her mom rushed her to the ER this morning. It's very troubling and worrisome because everyone's getting sick. And she just had COVID this summer for the first time. The medical director at the Innova Children's ER says they're in crisis mode. Three days of fever, cough, congestion. Overwhelmed, like many hospitals, with a dangerous viral triple demic. The start of the flu season, the ongoing COVID threat, and RSV infecting large numbers of children who spent much of the pandemic isolated in virus-free bubbles. Already, this children's ER has broken its yearly record for treating patients. We'll have 70 patients in the department at any one time in the evenings. With and just 21 beds? With 21 beds. It's not unique to this hospital. Nationwide, 73% of pediatric inpatient beds are full right now. Here in Virginia, 76%. Many hospitals are now out of pediatric ER beds. Not only are there a lot of sick kids right now, there's no place for them to go. Meanwhile, the country is still averaging 367 COVID deaths per day, but only 8.5% of Americans have received updated COVID boosters to cover the latest variants. Get your COVID shot. Today, President Biden received his new COVID booster while urging Americans to get both flu and COVID boosters by Halloween. Your old vaccine or your previous COVID infection will not give you maximum protection. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Now to the 17-year-old fighting for his life, Eric Cantu, on life support after he was shot by a San Antonio police officer while he was eating a hamburger in his car at a McDonald's parking lot. His family now demanding justice. Here's Morgan Chesky. Tonight, Eric Cantu, the Texas teen shot by an officer in this body camera footage, is struggling to survive. Three weeks after the incident, still in critical condition. He is continuing to fight for his life on life support. Attorney Ben Crump and Cantu's family speaking out publicly for the first time. We just want to be there by his side every day to make sure he can breathe, make sure he's able to wake up and see tomorrow. On October 2nd, the 17-year-old was sitting in a McDonald's parking lot in San Antonio eating a burger when Officer James Brennan arrived on scene for an unrelated case, but says he recognized the teen's maroon vehicle. I got a vehicle over here that uh, fled from me the other day. He approached, opening the driver door. Get out of the car. <laughs> and opening fire. <laughs> the officer continuing to shoot as Cantu started to drive off. Shots fired! Shots fired! Cantu was found less than a block away. The teen suffered multiple gunshot wounds, including to his stomach, lungs, and arm. Cantu was initially charged with evading detention with a vehicle and assault on a peace officer, but those charges were dropped. Investigators looking into the incident quickly determined Brennan's use of deadly force was unwarranted. His employment was terminated after review of the incident. Brennan was later arrested and charged with two counts of aggravated assault by a public official. James Brendan turns himself in about an hour ago. The former San Antonio officer has since been released from prison after posting a bond of $200,000. We reached out to his attorney for comment on the charges, but did not receive an answer. They want the maximum. I mean, 
where we talked, it looked like he was trying to murder him. I mean, those many shots. The Cantu family now calling for justice. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. When we come back covered in coal dust and treated like a king, you'll want to stick around for this one, a fan and a father. What he did for his son that has an entire state and a college basketball team talking. The story behind this incredible image. Stay with us. Finally tonight, a coal mining family's viral moment. A Kentucky father showing up to a preseason basketball game straight from the coal mine. That father's dedication touching hearts all over Big Blue Nation and across the country. For coal miner Michael McGuire, cheering on Kentucky Wildcats basketball is a family tradition. I was a little boy growing up watching uh, with my dad. Never did miss a game watching on TV. So when the Wildcat men's basketball team announced a blue and white scrimmage match in the McGuire's East Kentucky town, wife Molly was first in line to buy tickets. I hopped on and grabbed some tickets because I knew it was important to him and his dad, and I thought it would be a great experience for him to share with our son. Working in a coal mine as a roof bolter, Michael often works long weekend shifts. I started about a year ago, and it, it kind of blew my mind. It's literally just like a big giant cave. The day of the game, Michael ran straight from the mine to the game, still covered head to toe in coal dust, but dedicated to have this moment with his three-year-old son, Easton. Pretty much anybody that dunked the ball was his favorite. <laughs> Another Kentucky fan snapped this photo of Easton and Michael at the game. That image going viral and resonating deeply with someone else on the court. Head Kentucky basketball coach John Calipari is the grandson of a coal miner. And my phone rang and I had no clue who it was and I answered and he was like, hey, it's Coach Cal. And I was like, I just sat there. I was like, uh, <laughs> it was a complete shock. Coach Cal inviting the whole family to any UK home game this season. Adding on Twitter, the family will be treated like VIPs. From one coal mining family to another, the chance to carry on a tradition. It's been wonderful, you know, for him to see, you know, it's not just us. Everyone appreciates it. You know, it's hard work and it's it's a blessing. Another reminder why sports are so much bigger than a single game. We want to thank our affiliate WLEX for their help on that story. And we thank you for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.